So for tonight, I managed to forget my microphone. So it's just gonna be a, it might not come across as well on the video. But <clears throat> tonight, the thing God gave me to talk about was medicine, which was kind of an oddball thing. It seems very, very vague. And especially when praying about it more and he wanted me to talk about a more general concept of it. Which is fine. <clears throat> I'm doing it, aren't I? <laughs> You're gonna be okay with it. Yeah, right. <laughs> the fact that most of what God tells me to do gets met with a meh and then I'm begrudgingly doing it. <laughs> Maybe there's like a mild like child tamper tantrum involved. It happens. <laughs> I still do it. <laughs> Out loud or silently, you still do it. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, so when he was talking to me about this subject, basically, we're not going to be talking about medicine itself in the sense of like the, you know, the stuff that your doctor provides for you but rather to look at this a little bit more deeply and a little bit more expansively in terms of the things that we need for healing. Hmm. Because for God, you know, he... They, one of the big things with this is to talk, like talking about medicine explicitly, is to address the fact of like, you know, Christianity has kind of a weird relationship with medicine. And I mean, like you've had, there have been stories over the years of people in church, specific churches who believe in purely faith-based healing. And we get, and the thing about it is, is that they, they believe that it's a sin to use medicine. So they're like getting really sick and they're refusing mm -hmm. to take anything for it. And in scripture, even you see like situations where God provides people things to heal them. It's not all just uh, stories of Jesus laying hands on people and then praying for them to be healed and then they're healed, or simply telling them uh, you're healed and then that it's done. I mean, there's some weird stories. I seem to recall one specifically where he like he cures a man of he heals a man of deafness, putting his mud. Yeah, <laughs> there's the there's the one guy where he puts like his fingers in the guy's ear mm -hmm. and says open. Yeah. And then there's another one where he puts like mud on his on eyes. the guy on the guy's eyes. That's right. So I mean, we have that. You also have the story of like the bronze serpent, in probably one of the most uncharacteristic of God stories at that time. You have him. He tells Moses specifically to crap to forge a bronze serpent, which. You know, at a time when he's just getting after the Israelites for making idols. We just had the golden calf thing happen. And he's mm -hmm. like, uh, make a bronze snake. Okay. But then he imbues it with power that whenever they would get snake bites, they would touch it and be healed. They, of course... It wasn't touching it. They looked to it, I think, was what it was. Was that it? Yeah, was that all? They have, they have to look to it. Just look at it. Okay. Just look to it, and you'll be healed. They had to destroy it later because people started worshiping it. <laughs> um, Figures. That was in uh, that was under King Hezekiah, which is actually the the next one that I was going to bring up was Hezekiah when he had a. I believe it was, some people say it was like an infected boil, that was going to kill him. And God sent Isaiah to tell him. It's over. Get your affairs in order. You're going to die. Hezekiah asked for more time. Isaiah was turned around in the middle of the courtyard walking away by God to go tell him, okay, you get more time. And they used the juice of, the expressed juice of a fig to heal the, the thing that was going to kill him. So it's not like we, we have no stories of God using things like this to see his will done. 
even if they're obscure, I'm not sure what the the only chemicals that I can think of inside of a fig that have any beneficial properties are it's high in vitamins, as I recall, but I don't know if that kills an infection. But the uh, but the thing that we run into with it is uh, there's a lot of stigma there still. So we have a lot of people who are just kind of like, um, we need to like rely on God to be our healer, absolutely entirely all the time. And the funny thing about it is that kind of the the problematic side that we struggle with is that we the the drift from being Christian people who are open to whatever God's doing to people who believe that it's a crime like it's it's our lack of faith that's making us like rely on doctors and medicine is really really easy to slip into because it all it is is a question of okay well do you have faith in God to heal you and there is an it's really easy to drift into that place where we get into like guilt trips and shame and mentalities of like questioning our own belief and our own faith in God that can lead us down those paths and into those kinds of mentalities we can become people like that where we're lording that same burden over each other mm-hmm. and I've seen it happen before I've had a number of friends and family members and so on over the years where they they get in trouble with something they get scared or they get sick and they're just like but I need am I am I wrong for wanting to go to the doctor like is it a, a lack of faith on my part that I'm not trusting God to heal me and it's just like you have you might have a a bladder stone or you know you might have like an infection in, in one of your systems here you should just go to the doctor it's okay but we slip into those kinds of mentalities so easily because we think that we're taking control of things ourselves. And it's just like, well, maybe that's not... Unless God explicitly tells you that this is bad, it's probably not a bad thing to do to take care of yourself. In fact, more often than not, we are given the directions to take care of ourselves. We're, we're led through Scripture to take care of our bodies. We all know the verse, your body is a temple. Mm-hmm. Well, in those, in those processes, we're meant to take care of these things. We, I think we forget sometimes that a portion of our existence is meant to steward what God created. Mm, yeah. The whole purpose behind, behind, well, not the whole purpose, but a portion of why we were created and what God aimed to do with us in the garden was to have us help was to have us steward what he created to help him work his garden and our bodies our our worlds around us everything that that we touch there's an aspect of that which is us being able and willing to care for those things and a lot of us understand that like it's common knowledge in the church that oh yes i it is my job to help like bring God's name to the world it's my job to help people who are in need it's my job to do these things but we oftentimes look so far far outward that we don't think it's also my job to take care of myself Mm -hmm. like we have so many different parts where it talks about rest and the value of rest we did a series on rest at one point a couple years ago because it was such an imperative thing it's this kind of lost art in our in the church at large we don't value this we value very evangelistic mentalities of like going out and pouring ourselves out we'll quote Paul 
where he talks about pouring himself out like a drink offering mm -hmm. and then we'll run ourselves ragged trying to do something until we crash mm -hmm. and that's not good like that's one that's not necessary two that's not what we're called into and three that's not good for you okay Even Jesus took his time away from the disciples, took his time away from healing people. He would go off into the mountains by himself and he'd pray and he'd have time with God. He'd separate himself from, his, from the disciples in order to take time to rest. Because Jesus, though being um, God in flesh, he was still flesh. And flesh needs rest. Whether it's a rest in, and you know, when we talk about medicine, as it were, as it is in this particular message, talking about the way that we need to do the things to have the things that will help us heal. You know, it's not just like the compounds, or you know, if you're into naturopathic medicine, the the infusions or you know the ground up roots and different things like that that you would take in pill form to help your body heal or get better from things that are making you sick <clears throat> there's also things that we need to do for our minds and our spirits mm -hmm. because those are other parts of us that get worn down it happens and those are parts that we need to take care of too your emotions are important. Your mind is important. Those two things are very much so intertwined. If you're, if you're depressed, then the major like emotional thing that you're feeling all the time is sadness that will wear you down. It will have an effect on you physically. It will have an effect on you spiritually. How easy it is, is it to have faith in God when depression is telling you that there is no hope? And yet everything about God is having hope. And will you feel, you know, ready to tackle the world when you're feeling that way? Or will you instead feel heavy and weighed down? If, if rage is something that you struggle with, if you're constantly angry or you have something some kind of chip on your shoulder where you're trying to prove things and emotionally you feel that anger all the time you know are you going to be able to like in your spirit feel patience for people as they come out about and like harass you and so on or just make life difficult and physically, will you be able to like control your ha hands from throwing them at things that have pissed you off? I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's just this thing like we. There's so much that there's so much entanglement in our beings, and often if one thing is struggling, other things will struggle too. Mm -hmm. If you're physically worn down, it will have an effect on your mind and your spirit. If you're spiritually worn down, it will have an effect on your mind and your body. Mm -hmm. And that's why all these things require being taken care of. So what, what do you do to emotionally feel better? What helps your, lift your spirits? What helps, what helps take your mind off of the despair or the anger or, you know, whatever, it el whatever else it is that's negatively impacting you to make you feel bad. Or can you? If fellowship is something that helps, if friends are something that helps, then spend time with friends. That's your medicine. If it's just getting out and being around animals, for example. I think... Uh, you know, one thing that I've learned over the course of, like, working with horses is that they say that 
a lot of horse people tend to have a lower a lower resting heart rate than oh. your average person. Interesting. And the reason being is that horses' hearts, this is just what I was told. I haven't looked into the science of this, so I could easily be wrong. <laughs> but I do know the effect that horses have on people, so I think there's some validity to this, at least in in a sense. But uh, what I was told was that when a horse's heart beats, like our, we can pick up on it because it's so big, but they beat at a slower rate. And other creatures' heartbeats will actually kind of like calm to kind of match that. Mm -hmm. So it becomes this thing of like, if you're agitated, escalated, angry, you know, whatever, you'll calm down usually around the horses. There's just something about them, and they'll usually help people mellow out. You know, obviously, unless the horses themselves are agitated and doing things, at which point you're terrified because that's a. I think they're used for hundred... therapy too. Exactly. Yeah. Which is the point? That's why they're used for therapy, is to because they help people calm down. They have that effect. And animals in general can have that effect. Dogs will have that effect. I mean, we've all had that, those days when we've been like, we've had a rough day and then the dog comes up and like nuzzles you and like wants to be petted. <laughs> and man, it makes your day better, doesn't it? You're like, no one understands you but the dog. <laughs> the dog knows. <laughs> yeah. Look, I'm just saying, I've had a lot of bad days and having that weird little Pomeranian <laughs> walk up and like, want to cuddle really does help <laughs> but he cares about the details of your life he does he's just like you need emotional support right now and what and you know what I'm an emotional support dog <laughs> you need me <laughs> you need me now feed me <laughs> give me food <laughs> shut up and feed me <laughs> You know, it's, it's important, though, because these, these things are our medicines. You know, like, yeah, you can be put on something to balance out your emotions and that mess with your brain chemistry, but it's not always necessary to do something like that. And really, that it's not like it's bad or anything. It's just that sometimes there are other ways, other avenues. But whatever the case is, you should pursue those other avenues. You know, we all have had, we all know stories about the kind of flaws in healthcare and pharmaceutical companies specifically, so we, we understand that, okay? But in the end, the purpose behind, you know, this discussion is to just say, this is good, like, taking care of yourself is good, and finding whatever works as medicine to make you feel better is good, largely. I mean, obviously, if you feel a sudden sense of relief of your anger issues by burning somebody's house down, that's bad. <laughs> that is, it might be medicine for your soul, but what? it's not, I'm pretty sure God's not gonna sign off on that one. You are so close-minded. <laughs> <laughs> I am a close-minded man. <laughs> I was raised. Ecstasy I was, makes me feel great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which is another subject. We'll get there. I only talk about it now. <laughs> I was kidding. <laughs> but there were there are things that can really like help us and help us heal. And they're not going to hurt us in the process or hurt other people in the process. And that's really important. You know, we all understand the line that Jesus says, you know, all the commandments can be, can be summed up in this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And love your, brother, your neighbor as yourself. It's a very solid little standard to look at in terms of like the ways that you that you navigate and cope. 
And we oftentimes will talk about coping mechanisms with a negative connotation. And the reason being is that even though they can be like a, a form of, they can help, the, the damaging part is when they become, when they replace other things, when they become an idol in and of themselves. Yeah. And that's the problem that comes with a lot of coping, coping mechanisms. It's not looking for healing, it's a crutch. Mm -hmm. And that's why, and that's where we end up with like drugs and things like that. Even Except ecstasy. It's totally ecstasy. Ecstasy is <laughs> absolutely a crutch. <laughs> Maybe for you. <clears throat> Maybe for me. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh... In the end, these things, even though... In the end, these things can, uh, can replace and even drive us away from God in a lot of ways. And that's the, the damaging side of it. You know, do you feel good for a little while? Sure. Sure. Does it take your mind off of that pain for a minute? Sure. But does it actually help heal it? Well, no, of course not. A lot of coping mechanisms are distractions away from whatever's going on. And even though that's important and necessary sometimes, because let's say that you're struggling with like a particularly hard emotional thing and you need a break from it, but you can't find something to like help Heal, help healing with that wound well yeah obviously you need something to cope so you need like a distraction you pop on a movie or a TV show or you know like something to that effect and that's tell your a funny story tell a funny story sit, sit down and tell lots of funny stories tickle someone I don't know like I, I feel like that ends with like physical pain that usually makes some people cry it makes some people cry. It makes some people sure you don't stop. punch you in the face. <laughs> <laughs> and you're suddenly being kicked, and you're like, I'm trying to cope. And they're just like, not with me. <laughs> and they punch you. It's a bad day. There's like a verse in Proverbs that says something about a cheerful heart being good medicine. I'm trying to, I'll, I'll find it and see where it is, but there's, there's stuff about laughter. Mm -hmm. um, the Reader's Digest uh, column that was called Laughter Pill is the Best Medicine. Laughter is the Best Medicine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It so is. I used to read those all the time. Yeah. But yeah, that stuff's important. Like, you know, if the thing that you're doing is becoming a crutch, then maybe it's starting to outlive its use. And if it was, if it never could have been anything other than a crutch, then maybe it wasn't a good avenue to go with to begin with. I see a lot of people um, use things, like just to be more specific and more graphic, I've seen things like sex become like a major crutch for people they'll use it because they feel it makes them feel good it makes them feel wanted it makes them feel like you know like they matter but at the same time like if your problem is insecurities on those levels this can only last for so long mm -hmm. you get like 15 minutes on average to feel wanted and loved and different and liked and different things like that and then you have to go out and deal with real life where you go back to f struggling with your own mentality that tells you that that's not true. And that moment, those moments, don't negate that. It doesn't change your soul. See, the point with anything should be healing. Mm -hmm. If your, your emotional struggles are causing you pain, then you shouldn't be looking for things to make the pain, to dull the pain or to stop the pain for a moment. You should be looking for things that will cure the pain. Mm -hmm. If you're spiritually worn down, you shouldn't be looking for things that distract you away from it. You should be looking for things that 
bring healing to those places that bring revitalization or revitalization rejuvenation no what? stop it stop it <laughs> we're not going to, we did that last week we're not going there again <laughs> anyway don't show this to kids uh, no, these are never for kids. Okay. I don't, I'm not allowed to put them for kids. <laughs> I blame Heather entirely for that. <laughs> I am a kid. <laughs> anyway. But these are the things that we should be leaning on, looking forward to, looking, looking for, is healing in these places. That's the point of medicine. That's the value of it. And sure, like, the Holy Spirit is absolutely a source of that. God can absolutely reach out and heal somebody just in an instant. He'll send somebody to, like, pray for you and suddenly your stuff is gone. Amen. He'll send somebody to, to just reach out and be that person to talk to you to talk you through whatever's going on emotionally that's just tearing you down he'll send somebody to pray for your spirit and you'll be rejuvenated these are things that God will do but in the in all of this when we're, we're sitting here and being who we are and living through this world and the life that the lives that we have there are so many different struggles and so many different sources of pain that we can run into and have inflicted upon us. And especially when we start delving into, you know, who did this? And we start trying to put responsibility and we find that maybe those people aren't around anymore to take responsibility or to ask for forgiveness or to apologize. We still have to find healing God will provide ways, but we also have to be open to those ways. If you're, if you're looking for God to like send one specific thing, he might send a boatload of different opportunities for you to find healing, and you might completely n dismiss them because you're looking for this one way. He sends you a, a therapist, a doctor, a dentist, but you're demanding that he... Uh, that he heal your teeth through your broken teeth through through the Holy Spirit that can happen I've got more than enough stories of people from Bethel telling, showing me pictures of their teeth that weren't before and after but that doesn't mean that that's how he's always going to go about it it's not the only way exactly God may God may give you, you know, a specific dentist, or, you know, he can direct you in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. It's just important not to limit him. Hey, I'm back right. going to the room. Are the glasses? Yeah. So, yeah. In the end, like, this is a, All right, cool. this is something for us. Because in the end, we have to remember the fact that God loves us and he wants the best for us. He doesn't throw us into this world and all the chaos that's involved in it and just say, oh, good luck, find your way. You know, he's rooting for us. He's got our backs. He'll lead us and direct us. He'll guide us. And when we're faced with the things that this world will throw at us, he'll help us. You know, I've heard stories, everything from uh, God providing the right doctor for somebody at the right time. I remember my little sister uh, calling me about her uncle and about how he was going to die. And the doctors gave him the night to live and I told her to I told her to pray 
And she was just like, but I don't trust the doctors. I'm like, I don't care if you trust the doctors, trust God. So we prayed for him. And the next day he was healed. The doctors were bewildered by it. They gave him the night to live. And it was just this incredible miracle. And my sister was just gone. I mean, she was just like, what, what just happened? I'm like, God did, did a thing. It, it's what we go through. Like, it, this stuff happens. On the other hand, more often than not, we don't get stories like that. We get stories about being provided the right doctor, the one who will actually finally listen and try to take care of you, yeah. or the right counselor who will finally listen and like mesh with you, or you'll find like a group of people, new friends, new family who are able to be there for you and take care of you and fill the holes that were left by by the ones who were supposed to be that and failed to be it, to be it. We talked a few weeks back about how you know the world is kind of our own creation. God gave, when man sinned, God cast him out of the, out of the garden. And so we were left with the world as it is. And this world has been our own thing because we wanted to be like God. So now we have a world that's made in our image. And it's rough. And it's not a punishment per se. It's not a... Like, we live in response to the sins of our fathers and mothers. And that's how we spend a lot of our time. Most people that I know are trying to process through their childhoods and heal from those things. And that's when you finally get the chance to stop running and trying to survive, and now suddenly you're at a place of calm where you can process, where you can find healing, it's hard. And it's, it's difficult to look back. It's difficult to, to face all of that. For the friends that betrayed us, for the churches that betrayed us, for the rejections that we've suffered again and again and again, it's it's hard. And the thing of it is, is that like in this realm, talking about healing, talking about the medicines that we need, you know, whatever it is that's going to whatever good things you can find that will bless your soul, that will bless your heart, and that will bless your body. These are things to hold on to and to gain nourishment from, to gain, to be rejuvenated by. Because these are things that God provides for us. He'll direct you there if you ask. He'll help you find those people if you ask. He might just find, help you find those people anyways, without you asking, because he's like that. <laughs> Half the time it becomes a, a thing of like, well, they don't really know me yet, but I'm going to send them to this church or this group or to this family or this particular group of friends or give them this dog. Um, <laughs> and then they're going to come to know me because I have blessed them. Yeah. And then you wind up with stories where you're just bewildered. Like... You sit back and you look at it and say, how did I have to get this? Like, how did this come to me? Well, God provided you something that was going to help heal you. 
of the many, many wounds that you carry. You didn't know, there's no pill for your spirit. There's no root or herb you can take that will, that will make your spirit feel better. But God has ways. And our spirits are a very important part of us in the, the composition of the whole that makes up an individual human being. Like our spirit, we can bear here in the body. Yep. And, you know, it becomes a very difficult thing. We, it's hard to define uh, because a lot of us come from very physical mentalities. Oftentimes we, it's why like we have a tendency to dismiss emotional and spiritual stuff. Because, you know, if you get your, if you break your leg, obviously that inhibits you from walking and running. You can't run with a broken leg. But if you have crippling depression, well, you think you can still force yourself to be a light to people. So you'll, you'll push, and it'll wear you down. And what's more is then you run into things like last week we talked about imposter syndrome. Mm. It's a great way to generate imposter syndrome for yourself, mm. is by not being true to how you really feel and trying to act like some other way. Mm -hmm. Suddenly you feel like a fraud because you're, you're acting this way or you're trying to influence people this way. But you know that that's not really how you feel. You know that's not really what you believe. Because your feelings and beliefs are being encumbered by this, by this damaging mentality that you can't shake. It's like a broken leg inside your mind. Yeah. And then in the spirit, that's another thing. That's a whole other thing, too. Spirit can be a little harder to define in terms of like what it feels like to have it be shattered, but you... It's almost like feeling worn down, like physically exhausted, mentally exhausted, but at the same time heartbroken, mm -hmm. without the physical pain that comes from heartbreak. You, you instead just have this, you just feel crushed and you feel lost and you don't know why. You can sit back and you can look at your life and look at your experiences and say, I mean, there are lots of things that could cause this, but it's almost like none of them ever really quite do it. And then you're met with things like, subjects like, you know, God cares about you. God loves you and you just, you have this innate animosity or disbelief and maybe you want to believe it but you, it's hard it's hard to do that because there's just something that's broken so the, these are the these are the effects that these things have this is why we, we crave things that will help heal. And it's important for us to be able to acknowledge that we need healing in these places. That we need some form of medicine, some form of something that God can provide for us. Not something that we can abuse, something temporary that will bring healing in the time that we use it, in the time that we have it. And some things are permanent. I mean, when you find like a new family to kind of involve yourself with, that can that's usually permanent. At least hopefully. Maybe a physical analogy would be like eating, drinking, breathing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> Things that are just supposed to be a part of your life anyways. Yeah. Well we're we're communal creatures. You're you're gonna have people around you no matter what. Like you can be the most isolated 
misanthropic human being and you'll still have some weird person who likes to hang out with you. <laughs> I can tell you this from experience. <laughs> I know, like, for me, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, whatever, for whatever reason, there's always somebody who's just waiting in the wings. And you're you, just like, I thought it's Jeremy. No. No? No. No, I'm that person for Jeremy. Oh. <laughs> Whereas, what was it? My friend Chase was that person for me growing up. <laughs> I had no friends except one person, this obscure guy who would just not leave me alone. <laughs> and so often I'd just be like, I don't want him over. And then he'd be like, hey, I'm spending the night. I'm just like, what? <laughs> I already talked to your mom about it. <laughs> <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine fine and then we'd have a good time and I'd just be like yeah, yeah, this like Mr. That. Bear is a friend <laughs> Harley Harley's that person for everybody he is <laughs> that dog will find you and you will love him and that is all yeah I think uh, we see him with the tie I was being Fred, Fred Flintstone and going to you like Nathan eat that <laughs> give me some dinner yeah but yeah it's these things are important for us. And yeah, if we're going to like quantify it, eating, drinking, sleeping, those are imperative for your physical body. God's imperative for your, for your soul. The Holy Spirit's imperative for your soul. Faith and hope are imperative for your soul. Joy is imperative for your soul. Love is imperative for everything. Knowing that you're loved is important for your for your emotions. Knowing that you're accepted, knowing that you're not weird. I mean, we're all weird, but that's what makes it not weird. You know. There's no normality is a lie. We'll just mm. say it that way. <laughs> there is no normal. There is only weird, and that's all of us. Mm -hmm. I I can't I can't tell you how many. I still remember. Okay, just mm -hmm. to just to like validate oh, that no. statement. Okay, I remember oh, no. one of my cousins oh. trying to talk to somebody about like she was trying to convert this guy who was a satanist. And she was adamant that she was a normal person. And she fought and did everything she could to look normal, act normal, match some form, frame of normality. And I remember, I'll never forget the day she sat there on my couch, calling this person, talking to them, and explaining how all she cared about was going to heaven. She didn't care, and I, these are her words. This is what she told this guy. She was like, I just want to go to heaven. I don't care what happens to my body after I die. I don't care if a necrophilia comes in and plays around with it when I'm dead. Oh my God. All I care about is going to heaven. And I just remember looking at her and being, and I just stared at her. And she's like, what? I'm like, you pretend to be normal, but you are a weird person. <laughs> you, can, you can hide it all you want, but your strangeness, <laughs> it's clear. It should be, usually. Well, it's God only is the, the only thing is just being. There is. the only thing is to keep growing weird. That's the only right. thing I can think of. But that's the point. It's like it's important for your for our emotional well being to understand everyone's weird. Yes. Everyone's weird. And God will out weird you all. Right. Yeah. Like just know that you're not a freak because of because of your of the obscure things that you enjoy. You're not a freak, even though you might like Naruto. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. There are lots of people who do. And then there are lots of people who judge them for it, rightly. But there are all kinds of just different things, and it's okay. Your taste in music does not make you a bad person. No matter how, even though there are all kinds of little jokes I could throw in here about Nickelback or whatever. <laughs> 
I would say Nickelback way too often to like justify that. Don't get this wrong. Yeah. <laughs> it's all okay. Like it's all acceptable. There's no there's no wrong answer here for a lot of these things, and that's important for us to know. And that's important for us to hold on to. Because emotionally there's already enough to deal with in the world there's already enough that we struggle with the bible is full of stories of people suffering emotional harm because of just the the chaos of the states of things that were there and needing faith do you remember the story of the the paralytic man who he was lowered down to jesus through the roof. Mm -hmm. And Jesus didn't tell him, you're healed. He told him, your sins are forgiven. And he got up and walked. He was able to get up and walk because what was going on with him had nothing to do with phys his physicality. It had everything to do with his emotional, spiritual side of things. Mm -hmm. He felt so terrible that he couldn't get up. Mm -hmm. He felt physically unable to get up. And this is what's important for us to know is that is that there are places where things are hard and like all of this stuff is hard enough. Like the world is hard enough as it is. Mm -hmm. And it's important for us to be able to know these little things. To be able to navigate it. You're okay. You're acceptable as you are. And even though there might be places to grow, you're acceptable as you are. And you are loved. These are things that we can hold on to before we start needing things to medicate the problems there. A lot of, uh, I've read before that like one of the greatest forms of medicine physically is diet. Your diet will affect so very, very much of your physical be well-being. Sleep will affect so much of your physical well-being. And we oftentimes fail to really grasp how important those two components are. When I was doing bodybuilding, for example, diet was imperative. Diet was an obsession for people. What you ate had a direct impact on how you would look. It wasn't, you know, it's not like a thing where it's like a lot of us dismiss it. We don't think about it because it's not important. It's not valid. You know, pe we got people surviving off of nachos on a regular basis and they look fine. They're, they're fine. But for in bodybuilding, you're not you're not surviving off of nachos. You're eating chicken and rice every couple, every few hours a day because you're trying to maintain a physique, and it has a direct impact. If you if you break from that, you will notice a diminishment in your in your frame. It's right there. You can see it. It. With that background, there's kind of an understanding of just how much diet affects be our bodies. And sleep. Sleep is another one. I remember at that point in time, I remember like going to bed, looking out of shape and waking up in shape. Because it was my body just getting worn down from just days of not sleeping days of like you know whatever so your body starts to go into survival mode and it starts storing fats in different places and things like that because it's just like I don't know how to get through this man he's not resting there are just a lot of different fat these things are important and I use this as a backdrop to to kind of like to kind of jump off of those other things that we talked about knowing that you're loved, knowing that you're accepted, knowing that you're not weird as an emotional thing. The value of love, joy, hope, faith, and God for our spirits, 
they're, they are very much so the eating, drinking, and sleeping that the other aspects of our, our beings need. And another thing that I'll add on there, which it's another really important one for both of our both our spirits and our minds is community having other people when you have people who kind of go off on their own and they isolate themselves they get weird like everybody's been kind of struggling with that post quarantine there are a lot of people out there who are just like they're having a hard time communicating with other people. Mm -hmm. They're having a hard time socially, like socializing themselves again after they've been so isolated. And it's been kind of a, an existing problem in for a long time, like with uh, people who spend a lot of time with the internet. You find that they- Or video games, really. Yeah, video games, internet, any kind of like online interactions. Yeah. A lot of psychologists have been observing that, like, those people have a harder time in interpersonal relationships because they don't know how to interact. You'll see couples sometimes where they, they're they more comfortable on their, talking to each other on their phones than they are talking to each other directly. Mm -hmm. I've experienced that. I had a friend uh, who I tried to make my girlfriend and it didn't work. Because <laughs> she, she was on her phone? No, she was more comfortable on her phone. Like, if we were talking over Messenger, we had extravagant conversations back and forth, joking around, stuff like that. In person, not so much. She got really uncomfortable and anxious and awkward. And it was kind of a, it was an odd thing to experience. But it was there. So it's just kind of a thing that happens. Uh, it's it's out there, and as a result, we we're finding more and more people who don't really have that community side, and then they struggle with things like anxiety, uh, social anxiety, ex specifically uh, depression. As well as just uh, there's another one too, and I can't remember what it is. But it's just another one of those things that we need. Basic need is community, mm -hmm. other people, friendship. And yeah. And that's, uh, about what I've got.